Hello everybody, my name is Sophie and welcome to another video. Happy Halloween to everybody. Can you guess what my costume is for this special Halloween episode? I'll let you guess for a second. I'm a fae. Re. <laughs> I'm not sure what I am. I just have a lot of glitter makeup and I wanted to put it on. <laughs> We have all of the sparkles going on, sparkle on my lips, sparkle on my eye. You know, let your imagination run wild. I hope everybody's doing good, I hope everybody's doing great. I haven't done a review in a while. Two weeks. <gasps> Guys, I'm sorry, it was, it's been two weeks. Oh my god. When I upload other videos in between, like podcast episode and reading vlogs, I don't even notice how time's passing. <laughs> but alas, my last review was about Once Upon a Broken Heart and today's review is going to be about Immortal Longings by Chloe Gong. I didn't like it. I rated it one star on Goodreads. My Goodreads is at Honestly Sophie and I said, please, no, I don't know. Let me, let me look it up. <laughs> I'm begging you, keep Chloe Gong away from Shakespeare or the other way around. Just Please stop writing Shakespeare retellings. That being said, before we get into the review, I feel a little bit out of practice, I have to say. I feel like it's been two weeks and I just feel like I'm out of my out of my routine, you know what I mean? I want to thank my members and this is a very special thank you. I have members on my channels, they are called the Book Haters and you can become a member if you want, there's a link in the description. Members get early access to all of my video a day early, which is a lot of time quite frankly. And they also get to get a shout out from me and they get to vote on my next reads. I also promised if we hit 10 members, 10 book haters, then I'm going to make my Ruby Red movie commentary live for members. And I am very excited to announce that we have hit 10 members. Ah! <laughs> Happy Halloween! <laughs> Just in time for Halloween. Which I don't really know why that's in time. We have hit 10 book haters and by the time this video goes live, 4 members, which is a day early, hopefully, the 30th and not the 31st, because I want to upload this for everybody on the 31st. Otherwise, it's like, happy Halloween on the 1st of November, bitch. It's Christmas. Get your act straight. I will post a community post with the link to the movie commentary. Just a reminder, if you also really want to watch the movie commentary and become a member, if you are from the country of Germany, Austria or Switzerland, you will not be able to watch the movie review because it's restricted in those countries. That's why it's private at the moment, because I can't monetize it and it's copyright restricted. So I hope everything works. So shout out to my members. My members are Hayley B, Ashley Ranger B, Mrs. Preminger, Trinity ELW, Clara S, Kush Meta, Deja, Book Banshee, and Queen Sif. Love you, Queen Sif, my newest member. We actually also have a secret member who I'm not allowed to mention. You can take a guess who it is. I'm not allowed to mention it. He said, don't, don't mention it. It's okay. But he was like, I'm going to support you. But I didn't tell you. So we have 11, but he just did it like the other day. Thank you so much to all of my members for supporting me. I love you so much. And I'm so excited that it's 10 members. That's so many. It's 11. But it's a secret 11. It's 10. Like, he doesn't count, you know? It's an unofficial member. Official, unofficial. <laughs> that being said, let's get into the review. Let's talk about Chloe Gong first, should we? Chloe Gong is an Aust No, I don't want to disrespect her. I think she's from New Zealand. I don't know if people get uh, really uh, specific, people who are from New Zealand, if they get really like, I'm not from Australia, I'm from New Zealand, if it's like a big thing. Do they like each other, people from Australia and New Zealand? I don't know. I don't really know. Peace and love. She was born in Shanghai and she now lives in New York City. So she's probably got, has, she has a lot of money probably if she lives in New York City. But that being said, she did go to a college with Alex Astor. And what the fuck would you want to go to American University and pay and go into debt? Maybe her parents are rich. I didn't do that much research about Chloe Gong because her and I, we don't really, you know, we have a little bit of beef. I reviewed her book, her first debut novel, These Violent Delights, like two years ago, maybe? That book came out at the end of 2020 and it was an instant hit. It was her de debut novel and it popped off and no one, I feel like, tells her that maybe not everything she writes is good. And I think she has a lot of yes men around her. And again, the person that she has around her is Chloe, no, Chloe Gong is herself. So 
Alex Astor. <laughs> Alex Astor is the author of Lightlark, our infamous Lightlark queen, and I have made a podcast episode about her. I've made a review of Lightlark when it was popping off, and you can tell that they're really good friends because both of their writings is not really good. Peace and love to Chloe Gong, of course. She is 24, so she's only two years older than me, and she's published five full-length novels now in the span of three years and i talked about it in my reading vlog but since nobody watched that <laughs> i mentioned that i think that's insane and i sh think she should slow down i don't know what kind of contract she took and signed for her to be publishing that many books in such a short amount of time but especially if you're a new author who's still trying to find maybe your style I think you're doing more bad than good. Hmm. She published the last book to her other series. With the ones with the fugly covers. I mentioned every time I talk about her books, but truly, I don't know who was like, yay, those covers are pretty. That The covers are ugly. Ugly. I'll tell you what it's called. The Foul Lady Fortune, the last book in that series she published in September. Foul Heart Huntsman, I think it's also just a duology. But she's written like a bunch of fucking... Uh, what is it called? Novellas. Ugh. She, she's busy. Not only five full books, but also novellas. Like, how, what else are you doing, queen? Immortal Longings came out in July. So July and September this year, she published two different books. And at her age, I think that's very ambitious. Authors that are older than her and more experienced than her are not even doing it. And I think her writing as a young author, and I'm talking as someone who's never written a book or never published a book and probably never will, I think it's kind of... Uh, suffering under that and my advice Miss Chloe Gong if you're watching this peace and love slow down maybe take a little vacation think of something that's not Shakespeare inspired because that's not your thing she's trying to make it her thing I can't wait to see which Shakespeare retelling she will butch her next <laughs> I think that, honestly, the ideas of her books, and I, I'm pretty sure I said it in my Violence Delights review too, which I also uploaded on the 31st of December. Oh my god, and this I'm uploading on the 31st of October. It's my Chloe Gong Day. <laughs> International Chloe Gong Day. So 31st of every month. That I think the ideas of her book are good. Her books, multiple. And she's just not skilled to write them yet. She is not a... Um, writing them good i want to say she's not a good author but it's really mean that's i don't want to say that also she wrote immortal longings as a new adult book instead of a young adult book and it, I, it, I wouldn't do that if i were her i wouldn't do it again it's a trilogy so she's gonna do it at least two more times because you know she has to write more books but after that i would kind of go back to ya the thing is what are the criteria that make a young adult book a new adult book the characters are older okay and what else gore swearing but it just still read like a YA book from her. It didn't feel any more adult. I think when you can make the characters 17 instead of 22, which they are in this book, and it, nothing would change, then it's, you can't, you know, it's not really, it didn't really work. Peace and love. Now that I talk all this shit, I have to, of course, give proof for my severe opinions <laughs> if you love this book and if this is your favorite book of this year or in general or of chloe gong's or you know or if you are chloe gong i hope you're not chloe gong click off then i mean this with peace and love i'm happy for you and everyone can like what they like and i don't mean this as an attack on people who like this book maybe a little bit on chloe gong because i just feel like i just feel kind of sad because i don't know i don't know why she's pushing herself so hard you know i, f I feel with a, a woman my age but this is not meant as hate on on her necessarily or anyone who likes this book if you like it you like it i probably like things that you don't like and so this is just meant for entertainment purposes only love you so let's see i finished this book a few days ago and i'm currently reading icebreaker so i have a little bit of a disconnect i don't really know uh, what happened in the book. Five days ago I finished this book. That's the last note I took. And as I said, I'm currently reading Icebreaker. So if you want to see that review a day early and a reading vlog and my next podcast, you should consider becoming a member. A little silly member. Okay, let's go. And then after that, of course, Fourth Wing, the sequel is coming out. And also Light Lark. <laughs> 
and I'm gonna read those too. Um, Icebreaker, I'm still on the book, and he just fingered her in the Uber, which was great to read that on the train full train with people sitting next to me. I hope they didn't speak English. I paid 12 euros for that book, so please watch the ads. <laughs> so it's not a waste of money. Actually, you have to watch the ads now, right? Um, they disabled ad blockers, which I'm not a big fan of. I have to say I was using ad blockers and now I have to watch the fucking ads. I know how annoying it is, but you know, I'm gonna get more money now. <laughs> Just keep in mind that I'm reading the acknowledgements right now because I just realized you get a lot of information out of acknowledgements and I never read them. I just started doing it with, um, what did I read once upon a broken heart? And she says here that the story is not necessarily inspired by the Shakespeare in play, like loosely, but it's more so inspired by the character or the people, Anthony, Anthony, I'm, oh my God, is it not Anthony? Because it doesn't have an H, you guys didn't tell me, is it Anthony? Nobody told me. Antony and Cleopatra, the characters. And then she says, I mostly wanted the codependent obsessive relationship between Kala and Anton, which is the counterpart for Cleopatra and Antony in her book, to be the beating heart behind the story. And she did not succeed in that. So. The reason I read this book, by the way, is because someone suggested it in the comments. Their name was Sadie. And I was like, I haven't, I've never heard of this book before. I did not know that this was a thing. I only know that she wrote the ugly books with the ugly covers. And the Mortal Longings cover, the black one, I think is really pretty. There's also like a different edition. I think it's the UK edition, which I don't like that much. But, you know, to each their own. They're, of course, an upgrade. To the, but that wasn't hard. For the fuck, really. I just cannot... I have to reiterate how ugly I think they are. I truly, the graphic designs team, they truly did not give a fuck. With that pink background, ugh. Ugh, get shivers. And then my members voted for this over Icebreaker. But Icebreaker was second, which is why I'm reading it now. I really wanted to read it and I'm already, if in case you're wondering, I'm 20, no. I'm actually 30% done with Icebreaker. So that's coming very soon. What is Immortal Longings about? It's about a retelling from Cleopatra and Anthony and I saw it in my fucking uh, reading vlog already. His name in German is Antonius and I think that sounds so much stronger and I'm not sure why his English name is Anthony. Sounds weak. <laughs> Sorry if your name is Anthony. Love you. You're strong. Your name however? Hmm. <laughs> These two are our main characters. We have Carla and Anton and there's also a third main character called August. Whatever, we don't care about him right now. What they're doing in this world is a Hunger Games from Wish. And they pitched it as Hunger Games inspired, which is why I'm ex like explicitly mentioning it. It's pitched that way. Um, and it's really bad. It's a really, it's a very loose inspiration on the Hunger Games. And everything in this world gets explained to you very precise, very, 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 very precisely. And I cannot even, when I think about it now, after finishing the book, it's been a few days. I still get so angry about the amount of exposition I had to fucking read. I still get mad about it. Why did I have to read about the history of a fucking uh, fantasy world? I, I know more about that than I know about my own country now. It's not true, I'm German. I know a lot. You completely freely apply to these Wish Hunger Games. They are not forced upon the people. But everyone's broke in this world. Everyone's poor. It's a dystopian, futuristic world where everyone has technology, but everyone's super broke. We don't know why they're broke. That's a thing that we don't really know. <laughs> Whatever. Brokeies. Fuck the broke. And so if you are so desperate that you, like, you desperately need money, you can apply to these Hunger Games and then you get picked. If you're, if you're lucky, you get picked. And it's 88 people. 88 contestants. For it being such a specific number, 88 is a very odd number, also a very large number, and they're specifically, like, hand-picked out of applicants. We never get an explanation as to why 88? How do you get picked? What are the, What is the criteria? Why is it? Why does this exist? What is the benefit to the kingdom? Just entertainment? People dying? We need people dead? Then I don't really know. I don't really know. And it's the focus of the story. It's supposed to be the focus of the story besides Anton and Carla. And it's not done very well. Nothing in this book was done in a way where I was like, oh, that's good. <laughs> 
only hate, no love. I'm sorry. This is a dystopian with a little bit of magic and also we'll see how long I keep these ears on because they start hurting after a while. <laughs> People have chi and if you have, if you're lucky, you get the ability to jump into other people's bodies. And this is literally just what it means. Like your chi is your soul and you can put your chi into another body and then occupy it. And that person just gets pushed to the background or maybe even dies, you know, ugh, if you're unlucky. And this is a very, very rare ability. Not everybody can jump, but everybody that we know can jump. And like a lot of people do it freely. And it's banned by the palace, don't worry, like it's illegal because it's unfair that people can do it and other people can't and just take over other people's lives. So it's illegal, but if you do it on the street openly and if you do it to people, they won't say anything. They won't say anything, they'll just go on with their lives. If you occupy someone's body and you come out of their body again, they will just say, oh my god, what just happened? Where am I? They won't say, what the fuck did you just fucking do to me? They'll just be like, oh, not again. <laughs> not my, my whole body being stolen, not again. Fuck. It's a very weird... I don't, I don't know how to put it into words. It's a very weird state that this world seems to be in where this ability is banned f for good reasons. It makes sense that it's banned, but everybody still abuses it and people don't really question it. People just kind of live with it. They're just kind of over it. And that's why consent in this world is also very blurry. And there's a scene later where the two main characters have sex and the dude doesn't have access to his original body because it's, it's in a cell. It's in a fucking prison, you know what I mean? He can't access it and so he is just in different bodies all the time and he has sex in that body with the main character. And then we'll talk about it when, it, when we get to it, but I just think that this is a power that you give to your main characters that is so complex when it comes to the consent and how this world functions and you don't treat the topic accordingly. It's not explained well enough. I was not content with the way this topic was handled. And so we also get a scene in the very beginning. We start with August's perspective, who is the crown prince. And now let me explain this world to you. It's very confusing because she just makes it very confusing. She is not very good at explaining... She's not very good at world building. Like, I believe that in her head, she has a very clear picture of what this world looks like and how it functions. But actually putting those words on the page, it doesn't come across right. It just comes across as too much and convoluted for you to give a fuck. And that being said, I didn't mention this book received very poor ratings. It has a 3. Point, uh, or very poor. It has a 3.5 on Goodreads, which is quite frankly not really good if you compare it to these violent delights with which everybody loved and it's her debut and now she publishes her fifth book and she's getting compared to her other books really bad reviews. Maybe that's gonna be a reason for her to slow down. August is the crown prince of Sun Air which is what the cities are called, because it's actually two cities, it's Sun and it's Air, and they are connected. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Ugh. So there used to be a royal family in Sun and a royal family in Air, and they ruled together over Sun Air, and now there's only one king who rules over both cities because Kala actually killed everybody else. <laughs> Oops. Now there's also provinces around of Sun Air, in other countries and there's a whole history that Sun Air was at war and then there is some weird murders going on and everybody thinks not everybody they think it's the weird uh, uh the weird people from the other country invading them and they do like a Illuminati symbol to show that they're from the resistance or whatever but it's not them it's like an inside operation I don't really know what's going on in the fucking fucking political word of this book because quite frankly at the beginning I was trying very hard to follow Whatever she was saying, she explains sun, air, sun is the the heaven and air is the earth or maybe the other w fucking way around, I don't know. And both of the cities are dirty and they are really intertwined and there's like no sunlight because everything, ev all the buildings are so tall and they like go into one another, everything is so dirty and nasty. And she explains this to you over and over and over and over again with just different words. And it's like, we're 70% in and you're still telling me the street is dirty? I think I fucking know. You don't have to give me this exposition anymore. And it's truly in every chapter, pages, no, 
not pages, but paragraphs and paragraphs of exposition. And I'm not a world building girly to begin with. It has to be there. Yeah, right. Obviously. But I get really overwhelmed with world building. She was just doing too much. Guys, she was just doing too much. That's what the world looks like. There's just one king that rules the Twin Cities, Sun Air, and August is the crown prince. That's all we need to know. And he, in the very beginning, demonstrates body jumping with Chi, because of course he can do it, because he's the crown prince, but not by blood. He's adopted. So, he can just do it. Peasant, who can do it. Hmm, okay. He jumps into the body of a child, which is, of course, again, questionable, because he's taking over a child's body. And this is allegedly supposed to be very hard to do. Why? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, it's just hard. And he can do it because he's so strong. So, he jumps into the body of a child and then he goes into the slums, which the whole city is just a slum. There's like, supposedly, really nice districts with like, the rich people. But I don't believe it. Because apparently the whole city, everyone's poor and broke. Fuck the poor bitches. Very few civilians are powerful enough to jump into children, which makes them the most trusted, daring between buildings and into every corner of sun air without notice. So people don't think that children could be occupied by someone else, at someone else's chi, you know? And that's why they do a lot of the jobs, because they are very trusted. Why they are hard to jump into again, she does not elaborate. The one thing that I want to know, she doesn't explain it to me, love that. Thanks, Queen. The technology in this book is very confusing to me because it gets mentioned explicitly at one point that it's very... What's the word? It's in the beginning stages, but every but there's like internet and, and smartphones and computers. And also in the beginning, this dude goes somewhere to get a, a picture developed. Okay, just... What? Developed? He is now not in the body of a child anymore, but in the body of a bodybuilder security man. And he says, August, or it's actually not he says, it's third person. The narrator tells me, August lifts an eyebrow. It's hard to do in this body. Why? Did he get Botox? Why is it hard to do in this body? I'm confused. This body is large muscular. He doesn't want to go too fast or he might tip himself off kilter and stumble. He closes his fists together and frowns, circling around the car- Whatever. There is no indicator for me why the, it would be hard to lift a fucking eyebrow. Can muscular men not lift their eyebrows? Did he get Botox? I don't know. A very confusing line. Kala is the other main character. She's Cleopatra. She's the silly little cousin of August, but not by blood. And he finds out, because he gets the picture developed, that she is still alive. Because everybody in the palace said after she murdered her entire family that she was also murdered. They didn't say, she's the murderer. They said, someone murdered the royal family and she was murdered along with them. And so for the past five years, she's been in hiding. Okay? August is looking for her because he knows that she's entered into the games and that she was picked as a contestant and he wants her to kill his adoptive father, the king. Because he wants to be king. And the man is old but he cannot wait. And this is the best plan he can come up with. He says, if you win the games and I help you win the games because I can manipulate them because I'm the crown prince, you can just kill the king at the end of the games when he congratulates you for winning the games. And she says, you know what? That sounds like a great plan. I'm gonna do that. Now, why does Kala agree to this? Of course, because she hates the monarchy. She hates the monarchy and she believes, after five years in hiding, that the people of Sun Air will have a better life. She's just really upset that everyone's poor. She believes everyone will have a better life if she kills the current king and puts her cousin August on the throne, who will also be king. Nothing about the system will change, because of course the system is not the fault, it's just the king. So if you kill the king and you put someone on the throne that you know and who's like a proper good person, everything's gonna change. That's her idea of justice after five years in hiding. She couldn't come up with a better fucking plan? Okay. We're just gonna run with it, you know, for the sake of my sanity. <laughs> now that there is the issue of body jumping that's illegal but everybody still does it, you're gonna ask me, Sophie, okay, how do people make sure that the person they are speaking to is actually them? 
like how do people identify themselves? Well, there's of course a solution for this. People have identity numbers, social security numbers, and that is like the currency in this world. Or not the currency, but when you have a house, you don't have a key, you have your social security number that you enter into the door and then it opens for you. But the system is easily, mm, how do you say it? hacked because apparently it doesn't really matter because people can just watch you use your identity number and use it for themselves when they jump into your body so <laughs> who can you even trust besides yourself <laughs> at this point we don't know why Kala is hiding or who she even is they don't mention it i knew it because i read the blurb i knew it and it says she has to enter her identity number into the wristband because <laughs> for the games they get a wristband they got a silly little bracelet for the games and she has to enter her identity number. It's like an Apple Watch, I would imagine, because she has to enter something on it. She has to enter the identity number to confirm that she is still in the games every 24 hours. And if you fail to enter your identity number, you're out of the games. And you can also, there's a chip in your wristband, you can just take the chip out and then you're also out of the games. Or you could just lose it, you know? And then it's explained later because she fights Anton and he steals her wristband and she's like, fuck, if I don't enter my identity number, I'm going to get disqualified from the games. The brutal Hunger Games where everybody has to kill each other. I think that's a very weird... Those are very weird. Why would people participate in this? This is so weird. Why... They can just take... They can just not... <laughs> I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> this is not the Hunger Games that I know. The game start, I'm, at this point, you're just kind of waiting for something to happen because there's long stretches in this book where just nothing happens, to be honest. And I think that Chloe was trying to do a lot of things in this book. There were also a ton of fucking characters. And I hate when there's many characters because I can't remember names. But I think she was just trying to... Uh, include a lot of things in this book that she thought were cool that she, sh that she thought was slay and i think she put too much on her plate if that's what you say i think that's what you say uh -huh, i'm german sorry i don't know your idioms the game start it's really boring everybody gets their wristband obviously anton is there he also entered the games and kala entered the games and august is kind of manipulating them from in the castle in the palace there's also some sort of weird deaths going on that is august's plot he's trying to investigate them with his side characters and in total i don't know how many characters there are in total but it's a, it's a fucking lot of characters and it's hard for me. There's just a lot of talk about buildings and the city and the history. And then you get explained because there's apparently this rebellion going on with the, the country that they fought a war against. And then the farmers are poor and everyone's poor. And you get a lot of background information, a lot of history on... I've mentioned this before. A lot of history on the city. And I feel like there is more explaining and exposition than anything else happening. In this book and it's not like the history and exposition is put into the book naturally where there's like characters talking about it or talking about the relevance of it it's literally just paragraphs and paragraphs of no one speaking and just the world being explained to you and it made me I, it gave me a flashback to my history lessons in high school and i truly don't know who gives a fuck about her world as much as she does because again, I think in her head, she has it all figured out and she really loves the world she created. Cre- Yeah. Cremated. <laughs> but we don't. We want to see some action girly. Not some fucking- the, the fucking floors are winding and the city is dark. I don't care about that shit. Give me some ass. <laughs> Give me some cock. You know what I mean? I'm reading new adult. <laughs> so then the first encounter we have between- Kala and Anton is when he steals her wrist her wristband. She calls up August. She's like, "Hey, sorry, I got my wristband stolen. Can you please manually make it so it doesn't get shut off after 24 hours if I don't enter my fucking number?" And he says, "Yeah, no problem." And that's how that is solved. And it's really boring because while the Hunger Games is kind of this ongoing theme in the book, the focus very much does not lie on these games i'm not sure what to tell you what the focus lies on maybe the exposition of this world because there's a lot of it and you're sick and tired of me saying it you're like girl we heard it you told us before but i there's nothing else to tell you 
Because the whole... I'm 70% and then she's still giving me fucking exposition. Do you understand how insane that is? She's still building the world and I'm almost finished with the book. Sorry. They are evenly matched according to Anton, her, uh, him and Kala, which is why he steals the wristband because to him there is no other way than this to eliminate her. Instead of just stabbing her in the back, he cannot do that. He th He's really impressed by her because there's a scoreboard and she's leading it with the kills and I don't even- I just went on a tantrum, I don't know if I said it, but the action sequences in this book are very short. You get them every now and then where they have a silly little fight and they kill someone, but it, it's not more than that. And there's- because of this, because of these short action sequences that are not very intricate, there's no sense of urgency at all, even though there's a Hunger Games going on. And they have to fear for their life the whole time because at some point on the wristband they also show um, or they give off signals when you're close to another player so the games kind of speed up because they're all over the city. The entire city is an arena. Oh, both of the cities. It's two cities. Sorry. <laughs> but you never once fear for the main characters. And of course, when you know the book or the series is going to be a trilogy, no, you're not going to really fear for anyone. But... It takes, a good, <laughs> it takes a good author to still make you fear for a character, even though you know it's going to be a trilogy, even though you know it's not going to be a standalone. But there w I was never once afraid that Kala, anything was going to happen to Kala, everyone... And I didn't care about Kala either, but it, I didn't once think, oh my god, she's going to die, this person's going to die, this person's going to die, never. It was very clear that they were just the best. And nothing was gonna happen. Never once were they threatened. You know what I mean? Even if they were like kidnapped at one point by a fucking cult, the I don't fucking know, like the bad guys from Assassin's Creed. Never once did I fear for her. I was like, okay, she's gonna get out of this one way or another. There's like 20% left of the book. We get this little paragraph. I'm not sure who she's talking to. I think it's a child. And she goes, it doesn't matter to me. Kala gestures at the waiter again, catching his attention so he knows where to bring the food. Great of you, great um, description. I don't leave this body though. Truth be told, she never really, she's never, oh my fucking god. Truth be told, she's never felt like she aligns one specific way, but she enjoys femininity and how it looks on her. Kala is a woman in the same way that the sky is blue. She understands that it's the easiest identifier to slap on and she doesn't mind it, but in actuality, the sky is an incoherent incomprehensible void and Kala too feels closer to a nebulous inexact entity. Before she's anything else, Kala is just Kala. Which every time I say Kala I do think of Carlisle. Love you, vampire daddy. <laughs> Happy Halloween. <laughs> so I think what she's trying to tell us is that Kala is gender fluid, non-binary, either or which, of course, I enjoy representation in books. The August is also, I think, supposed to be gay because he has, like, an assistant who always hangs out with him and everybody allegedly can feel, like, some tension between them. And I don't remember his name. It was, like, something with G, like, Galapagos. It was something... A, a name that you don't hear regularly. But I didn't feel... If I hadn't read people say... I'm so... On her TikTok, I'm so excited. I hope that they find to one another. I wouldn't have thought that they were going to be a thing or that August was gay or the other dude was gay. There's like one or two lines where it's like, do you uh, finally accept what he's feeling for you? Like other people pointing it out. But I was like, I, I'm not sure how I feel about this. I don't think, I don't, I'm not feeling the vibes. I was not feeling the vibes between Kala and Anton either. I think the romance was really ass in this book. It, like there was no, I don't know. I'm a romantic and I did not feel good about this. So I like that she included representation for, yet again, I'm not sure on the terms, non-binary or gender fluid. Or is it the same thing? I don't think it's the same thing. Um, but I don't know that well. Anton and Carla then decide to team up at one point. The reason for this is unbeknownst to me because they are both the strongest and they kind of say like, if we're together and we're going to do this together, then we're just going to get done faster, I guess. But I never really, in the entirety of the book, got a vibe that there was like something going on between them, that they they just thought each other was hot and quite frankly I'm not sure how she can think that he's hot because he was in other people's bodies constantly. He's never in his own body, he just chooses hot people to be in but you know she's just attracted to his character. Which is nice. She sees past the exterior, 
she just loves Anton. But I'm not sure what their reason was for teaming up in the first place. I don't remember it. And if you're wondering why Anton is in the game, he has a girly who is actually August's stepsister, half-sister, or sister. And she's in the hospital, and he's in deep debt. Depth? 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 Hmm. Schulden. I don't know in English. Because he's trying to keep her alive. She's in a coma from... Ugh, this is so complicated to explain, guys. She's in a coma because she tried to escape the castle, and then they were caught, and that's why his body is in exile. But the girlie who's in a coma, she tried to jump into the body of a guard or multiple guards, and all of the guards in the castle are people that can jump, but their bodies cannot be jumped into. That's like the good thing about their bloodline. They all have silver eyes and they can't be jumped into. That's why they're the guards to protect the king, because they can't be taken over. And out of panic, she tried to jump into their bodies, but she fell, failed multiple times. And now she's in a coma, because this is like a known sickness to people who fail to invade other people's bodies too many times. They kind of burn up. And usually people die, but she's just in a coma. And so you know the entire book, that she's gonna wake up again. And she does in the end. We don't know why she wakes up. She does wake up and she's like, take me to the palace. And that's how the book ends. But anyway, he's trying to keep her alive because he loved her, but they were children. I don't know if they fucked. I don't think they did. He's trying to keep her alive. And even though she is August's somewhat sister, he does not give a fuck about her. The palace doesn't take care of the bills and he has to take care of the bills to keep the machines running. That was a really long explanation. I feel like I didn't take a single fucking breath. <sighs> Let's drink something. That's why he entered the games. Because if you win the games, you get a lot of money and he needs the money to pay for his debt because this woman is in the hospital. This girly. Love her. I'm not sure if we love her. Apparently she's a bitch. Called it to August, who we don't like anyway. So what's the truth? So we don't really know what the jumping gene is, what they call it, what other abilities it gives you. There's this secret cult that's not so secret. Everybody knows about it. It's called the Crescent Societies, and they are making or they're doing experiments on humans, and they are trying to find the truth of what the jumping gene could do. And so they're doing like blood rituals and shit like that and they actually have more power like magical powers like choking people without touching them or punching them in the face without touching them and they get kidnapped at one point by them but they escape so don't worry now kala i don't know what's up with her she says the narrator says kala kicks a pebble launching it in anton's direction he barely darts out of the way before the rock strikes the wall leaving a visible white dent does she have like super human strength all of a sudden, I'm not sure what's going on. Now, Kala, as I said, she used to be the crown princess. She killed the entire fam her entire family. We, at this point, don't know why. But she seems to be very passionate. Or we don't. Actually, we do know why. She is very passionate for the brokies. And she wants to kill everyone because they are putting everyone in the situation. And they're making everybody broke. And the world is failing. And everybody is dying. And she blames the royalty and the monarchy. But not enough to abolish, no, is abolish, demolish? What's the right word? Not enough to get rid of the system, just install a new king. So at this point she says, do they rise every morning? She's thinking about the royals and the rich people. Do they rise every morning with breakfast laid out for them? No hunger in a big comfortable bed? She knows it's unfair to think this way, but it's hard to push back resentment and at those in the Twin Cities who have never feared for their lives, who have no idea how the rest of Tallinn suffers, which is the continent. Now you're gonna say so, or the fucking, country i'm not sure i think it's the country not the continent you're gonna say sophie why the fuck is she so passionate about the brokies she's a princess she's the crown princess the five years that she spent in hiding she was very she was living very comfortably in an apartment enough to provide for herself for a cat she's never been broke in her life well keep that in the back of your head we're gonna talk about it soon then she's running away from evil guys with Anton and he also randomly starts licking her nipples which they then don't talk about anymore until they do have sex on the floor but we get a very nice display of Chloe Gong's writing ability she says the men surrounding him have knives she can see the bulges in their pockets I just feel like that is not fantastical enough for me Make it a little bit more elaborate. 
Like, this is writing that I could do. I don't know. You're going to say, what what kind of quote is that? That's so random. It just struck me as an odd quote. I'm going to be honest. I was like, okay, the men surrounding me have knives. She can see the bulges in their pockets. Maybe it's their big penises. Now, we're 50% done with the book. I felt like this was going to be a short review. I'm looking at the time. It's not. <laughs> I wrote down everything that bothered me about this book at 50%, okay? And some of these things get cleared up. Some of them don't. So we have to consent in body jumping. We've talked about this. Doesn't get cleared up. The characters having clear intentions, even though they are labeled as morally gray, it's also confusing. We know what they want and we know what they're doing. And then it's like, oh, morally gray. We don't know what they're going to do. But I do know. I do be knowing what they're going to do. You tell us explicitly on the page. Us not knowing why bitches is poor. Like, there's a lot of people in the city. Okay. It's convoluted. Okay. But why is everyone poor? To a point where it's like, unbelievably poor what's going on what's going on with the economy i also think that in a city that's so focused on everyone being poor it's interesting that our three main characters are all rich <laughs> i talked about this in the reading vlog but we have carla the crown princess we have august the crown prince and we have anton who came from nobility and then was shunned because he tried to run away from the palace or whatever so everybody's rich even though the city everybody's poor in the city why don't we get the perspective of a of a broke person i keep saying broke but they're like truly poor they're like suffering which is another thing the the broke people I, why do i keep saying broke i need like a different word the poor the less fortunate <laughs> the less fortunate people are described very uh, um how do you say oberflächlich what is that again oberflächlich surface level sure they're described at a very surface level where it's like he looks very skinny because he's so hungry he has he doesn't have food so he looks sick stuff like that but because we don't have a main character that's broke or has been in the position or have they been in the position we'll talk about it it doesn't feel like chloe really can grasp like she doesn't i i don't i understand <laughs> that the people are poor in the city and that they are suffering because she's telling me but the way she's describing it feels like she doesn't really know what being poor means <laughs> peace and love she seems to be doing great for herself living in new york city going to a private college in america with Alex Astor. I keep having to mention that girl. It's insane, but you know, whatever. <laughs> and I don't even know how to put this into words, but there's so much more to being poor and living in the way that she's trying to make me believe that people are living with psychological issues and everything. But everyone in the description she does are very surface level and they're very like, how you would imagine a poor person, but we don't really go into the depth of the issue, you know what I mean? And I think you should do that if you're writing a book where this is like the main theme. Is that just me? I don't really know how to put it into words, but do you get what I'm saying? Also, I don't know why nobody has a gun, because this is a very futuristic world. And let me look up the word gun just to see if she discusses this, because I don't remember if she does, and I wanted to look it up. Let's look for gun. Zero. Zero results for gun. Firearm? Let's look for firearm. Yes! The word firearm is in there. Ha! I knew she was not gonna do gun. She was not gonna do Glock. In the Palace of Heavens, they trained her to use everything. Blades and arrows, explosive and projectiles, even the occasional firearm when they could scrunch up the gunpowder, despite its rarity and sun air. Okay, but even if it's rare, I feel like August should have given her a gun and just sniped everyone. You know what I mean? That would have really sped up the games. <laughs> the cameras, there's security cameras in the entire city, which is why it's confusing to me that they say the the technology is at the very beginning when the entire city has security cameras that are working and providing news feeds and live feeds the whole entire time. It, it's weird to me because why would they already have that all of that installed when they're still at the very beginning of technology, whatever. They don't pick up sounds. Which is something that I was confused about at 50%, but it gets explicitly mentioned later that they do not have sound, sadly. Because, quite frankly, Anton uses Kala's full legal name on the streets openly multiple times, where he calls her Princess Kala, um, to but whatever the fuck her last name is, and it's like, do you not think people are listening? Do you think- are you not scared of anyone hearing what you're saying? 
Because she posted, she's dead. She's supposed to be dead. You know what I mean? And they also talk about their plans openly on the street. Which would be unfortunate if the cameras could pick up sound, but thankfully they can't. And then, of course, the last point. This just does not feel like an adult novel. Peace and love. But I told you this in the beginning, you know? She uses swear words, she has a sex scene that's explicit in a way where it could have also been in a YA book. She does not use the word cock. She uses the word nipple and boob, and she has Kala explicitly say, shut up and fuck me. But it's like, that's the whole extent of it. I don't think Chloe Gong is equipped to write sex scenes, quite frankly. Maybe Fade to Black or inexplicit, like... Inexplicit is the right word, right? Where it's like just alluded to, but she does not seem equipped to write an adult novel yet. So just stick to YA a little longer, queen. Love you. Then we have the kidnapping scene. Carla refuses to jump bodies and almost dies and Anton has to save her, which is when they have a little bonding moment and it's like, why doesn't she want to jump? I'm going to tell you right now. I've been alluding to it. This is Carla to Elimi's body, he whispers. But you're not Kala, are you? It turns out Kala is not Kala. That was a little girl and she was broke when she was eight years old. She was a broke farm girl and she was really jealous of Kala when she came to visit her city. And then she wanted to be Kala so bad that she jumped into Kala's body. And she was like, okay, I'm just gonna stay like this. I'm just gonna stay like this and pretend like um, nothing happened. And so the person that we've been calling Kala is not actually Kala, but she is Kala because quite frankly, she, I keep saying quite frankly, I really like using that, but if you haven't noticed yet, <laughs> it makes me feel smart. She jumped into Kala's, this not Kala, jumped into Kala's body when she was eight years old. They were both children and she explicitly says she does not remember the life she had before becoming Kala. She does not remember her name. She doesn't really remember her family. She remembers that she was a brokey from like a, an outer province that was a farmland. But that's all she remembers. She doesn't remember the specifics. And that is why she's so passionate about the poor people. Because she used to be a poor person. But to what extent? Then she doesn't, if she doesn't remember... You know? She doesn't remember. How can she be so passionate? She does not remember. She's been a princess, and she says this, for longer than Kala was a princess. And she does not want to jump out of the body because she is afraid that Kala's chi is still in the body. That she is still in there, and if she jumps out, she will not be able to get back into Kala's body. She has nothing to back this up. It's probably going to be an issue in the other books that I'm not going to read because quite frankly, Chloe, I've given you two chances and you've blown them both. <laughs> but this explains why she's so passionate about all of the poor people, even though she is a princess and she grew up a princess. But it's not enough reason to me. Like, uh, Chloe Gong wants me to now believe that she is just so passionate about them because, again, she was part of that group. But I don't feel it. I'm not feeling the vibes. I don't believe it. If she doesn't remember her life before, I'm not buying it. If she said, I remember my life before and how horrible it was, then okay. But she... I don't know. I just didn't buy it. I, I don't really care for them either, so maybe that's why. Then there's a child that they befriended, her and Anton, who dies. And it's kind of like Rue from The Hunger Games, but I, don't, I didn't even mention him, so whatever. You know, I'm just telling you that she was from the Hunger Games. She then has an issue where there is like assassins trying to murder her and one of the assassins says uh, a dude with black eyes sent us and in the entire city there's a lot of different eye colors and like also purple and shit like that like crazy eye colors okay and the entire city of Sun Air or the two cities of Sun Air there's only two people that she knows that have black eyes which does not seem accurate to me. I feel like there should be more. Okay everybody. Halloween is over. Sorry. I was talking about the assassins and the eyes, and it's a very interesting thing because she says that there's only two people in the entire city that she knows of that have black eyes, and it's August and Anton. They both have them. It's also mentioned that whenever you put your chi into someone else's body, another way to tell that that's not actually the person is through their eyes. Their eye color changes with them. You always keep your same eye color. And then if you leave the body, they get their original eye color back. And it's also explicitly mentioned that Kala has red eyes. And that is the color of the royal family. The red eyes, okay? The royal family that she's part of. I think the other ones have a different eye color, but... 
because there's twin cities, right? There's two royal families. She killed one of them and they have red eyes and so does she. But then we also have the information that she's not actually Kala and she changed into Kala's body when she was a random girl at eight years old, but she still has red eyes. How does that make sense? Since it is so explicitly mentioned like multiple times that she has royal red eyes, even though she's not really Kala, she's someone else, there's got to be something to it, but I didn't think that hard about it and I don't want to. So, sorry. She, of course, immediately accuses Anton, her lover, of sending the assassins and then she goes to his house to confront him and she's like, why the fuck did you send the assassins? And she tries to kill him and he's like, peace and love, girly. I have no idea what you're talking about. It wasn't me because it was August. It was the crown prince that's supposedly helping her. And he then says, oh, I did it because I wanted you to... Uh, I wanted the games to speed up and you've been lying low because after she got kidnapped by the cult, she was seriously injured. She almost died. And so she had to recover for a few weeks because these games go on forever, over multiple weeks. But if there's no arena, why the fuck wouldn't it go on for multiple weeks or months, months even? And then August sent the assassins to speed up the games and kind of get her back into the game because she's been lying low, recovering from her injury. But she accuses August. Then, after clearing up that it wasn't Anton who sent all of these assassins, they have a discussion about the end of the games, because obviously they're both still contestants and there's only one winner. And for the final two contestants, they always have a sp big like thing in a coliseum arena where they have to fight to death. The last two, like, the if there's only two, one of them has to die for the finale. Allegedly, you know? And Anton doesn't want to drop out of the games, Kala is kind of begging him. She's like, because at this point, after this confrontation, they also start having sex and things. They are very intimate one with one another. And I think this is what <laughs> what Chloe Gong meant when she was like, I want to have the, the passionate and obsessive relationship in the focus of the story. But quite frankly, fuck, I'm starting with the quite frankly again, different day, I'm still doing it. I didn't feel the romance between them. I didn't feel the vibe between them. They just kind of start fucking because that's the natural progression of the story. And you knew it was going to happen, but it was a very quick kind of change between the, the two characters, between their dynamic. Because the entire time they were like, we don't trust each other. We don't like each other. We're only working together out of convenience because we're the strongest. And then it's like, oh, never mind. I want to have sex with this man and I love him. They say, I love you. Like two fucking pages later. It's like, okay, that, I, I don't, I don't know. If you want to write an obsessive relationship like that, I feel like you should also give it a build up, you know? Like, if you want to make it insta love, then make it insta love, but they did hate each other at one point and then they just start loving each other and that's not a switch that happens naturally. You know what I mean? They have a conversation. He does not want to drop out of the games because he needs the money for the bitch in the hospital to pay off the debt and the bills that have accumulated. And I'm not sure why Kala doesn't just take the initiative and just remove his wristband because they are, after fucking on the floor, they are laying next to each other in the bed and they are sleeping and he is asleep. And she wakes up and she looks at him and never, never once does it cross her mind that she could just take his wrist and take off the wristband and disable it or hide it or destroy it or anything because that is a way to eliminate players and they do mention it and he's like i don't want to do that i don't i don't want to kill you but i also don't want to take off the wristband and it's like okay why doesn't she just say okay i'm gonna win and i'm gonna give you the money because i don't need the money i just need to kill the king and i'm gonna be pardoned by august after i kill the king it's not it doesn't matter to me I'm just gonna live my life. You can have the money. I don't need it. That's also not a compromise she's willing to make. And that's also nothing they discuss. That's n not an idea that comes up. It feels like it's very... Um, she, it feels like Chloe knew she had to have the characters discuss this. Because obviously, they're in the Hunger Games and they have to discuss this. It's like, you know, they're gonna die. But she didn't really want to do it. And so she just... All of the options that there are, she just didn't want to discuss them. Because she's she herself... Knew she didn't have an answer. She needed it to be. Sorry, touch the mic. ASMR? If he wants the money, just give it to him. They have sex. 
And I feel like there's some kind of issue here, is what I wrote down. Oh yeah, because he's in a different body. He's not in his own body, as I mentioned before. It's in the palace, in a cell. He doesn't have access to it, and so they just have sex in the body of a rando. Take your pants off and fuck me. He complies. There's a pause as he drops his clothes as... What the fuck? And draws Dira like he's waiting it out, gawking and her... Gawking? Her response? Gauging? How the fuck do you say that? This is someone else's body, but in sun air, the detail is as normal as jumping. When it comes to this sort of use, bodies are only accessories, discardable and utilized based on need. Again, if you write a book where this is an issue, the jumping, you have to look at it a little bit more critically, I think. Because this man did not consent to having sex with someone else in his body. I just don't... It, it feels kind of icky to me. Also, she doesn't commit to the sex at all. There's no funny scene for me to read out to you because she doesn't... She's very unspecific in a sex scene. It almost feels like she was uncomfortable writing it, if I'm being honest. And she just... It, it comes across as she was writing it because she knows as a new adult book there has to be a sex scene in it. Or she feels that way, maybe, which is not the truth. It, you don't have to include one if you don't want to. But it doesn't- it wasn't a good sex scene. Sorry, girly. Oh yeah, I was discussing her not remembering her broke life, and so it, it doesn't make sense to me that she's so passionate about the broke people. And then there's explicitly on page, she remembers nothing of the life she was born into, she remembers only the princess that she stole. So I'm not sure where that passion comes from. And her just having lived a life as a farm girl isn't enough of a reason for me if she doesn't remember it. I, it, it feels like a very uh, weird schwammig. Ugh. I never, I never remember this word. I always look it up. Spongy is not the right word. Unspecific, let's just go with unspecific. Or not unspecific, that's also not the word I'm trying to use. German is just so much better at explaining. <laughs> then of course we have to reference the source material of uh, Anthony and Cleopatra. And so uh, we get the quote, when it involves Anton Makusa, what you have is not love, it is obsession, which I'm sure that in some form was probably said in the Shakespeare in play because she does draw like quotes from it and puts it into her word, work and word actually. August is kind of over it at this point and he just decides to force them into the finale. So he kills every other player. So it's only Carla and Anton left. Obviously that was going to be the outcome. And at this point I stopped taking notes. So. How about I tell you from the recollection of my mind, my favorite part. And it's not very hard for me to do this because while the whole book dragged on and on and could have definitely been, like, definitely been cut a few pages, the ending is super fast paced. And by that I mean it's all what it feels like to me in the span of 10 pages. We have Anton and Kala in the final battle. There's also people watching them and Kala, for some reason, she's like, I'm so sorry, uh, bitch, I have to kill you. There is no other way around this right now. I have to kill you. I have to be the one that kills you. Please just let me kill you. Like, I just have to do it. And Anton is like, I'm not sure how I feel about this, girly. The characters just feel so underdeveloped to me. I'm so sorry. I just feel like I know what she's trying to do. I understand what she's going for. And I kind of see her vision with this book. But I just don't think she wrote it nicely. I just don't think that the, the way... I don't think she's capable... Maybe she would be in the future if she tried to write something like this in the future after more experience. But at this point, I don't think she is capable of writing a book like this. And we'll see how it develops, how what the reviews are like for the rest of this series, because it's a trilogy. But she rushes the ending so quickly. Literally, Kala stabs Anton. He dies in her arms. And then we get, she kills the king. This bitch from the hospital, whose name I don't even remember, wakes up, goes, take me to the palace. And then she's standing there after being pardoned by the king, the new king, who is now August. And they stand on a balcony, kind of like the fucking British royals, you know, when anything happens, they stand on this fucking balcony. They stand on the balcony and he's like, he gets the crown on his head and it's a whole thing because if he's not accepted by the gods, they believe in gods, then the crown will combust and kill him. But it doesn't! It accepts him! Woohoo! And then he looks at Kala, August now, right? She's standing next to him. She's been pardoned after killing the king. He's standing next to her and he says a line which she knows all too well. Shout out Taylor. He says something about the fine daylight in Sun Air. And funnily enough, this is a quote 
sentence that she has kind of come up with with Anton because he's always in a different body and so he they needed something to confirm that it is him whenever they meet each other and he said okay I'm just gonna say something about the daylight in sun air because no one ever talks about the daylight because it's always dark here because of the buildings they are all like at the top they all stick together and there's no daylight and she's standing next to August who she thinks is August with his black eyes and he says something about the daylight and Carla is like excuse me and then he looks down at her and it turns out it's actually Anton. Anton jumped into August's body at the final battle and therefore did not die and is now in the body of the new king. And it's kind of like, oops, um, that's not the outcome that I did plan. But honestly, I think it was kind of obvious. It's also like explicitly mentioned, and I was very much skipping the end of this book because I just wanted it to be over with, that Anton or that, that August is watching them and they can see him and in order for you to jump into a different body you need to be able to see the person which is why they often like slash eyes and everything so the person can't jump and Anton sees August in his line of sight and just jumps into his body before he dies and so he's not actually dead and August is also still in that body so if he jumps out of the body he will be in trouble I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to speculate about the future books because I don't care that much. But let's see what the last line was. That's, a, that's how it developed. That's how it went. That's how the ending is. So August is not actually dead. Oh no, Anton is not actually dead. Also, giving your two main characters the name Anton and August, even if it's historically accurate, you should have just chosen something else. I still don't understand why people give their main characters the same f like initial for the first names. You're usually not supposed to do that because it makes it confusing for the reader. And I was confused. Oh yeah, the last line, it's Anton. She says, It is not August Chensi, the rightful crown prince of Sun, that Kala has put on the throne. It is Anton Makuza. Um, do we care? I don't. Do you care? I think he might be a little mad because she did end up killing him in, or stabbing his body, his fake body, of a random person and saying you have to die so I, th I would be mad if i were him kind of depressed after anton is dead right and so when she also sees for august for the first time not knowing that it's anton she's like why the fuck does he look so mad why does he look so angry at me alas guys i didn't like this book i think and i've bashed chloe gong enough i think now sorry girly sorry guys the camera died we just gotta finish it like this good old times <laughs> as i said Peace and love to Chloe Gong. I think she has potential, but she's just not for me. I gave her a second chance. I gave her a second chance, maybe a third? If she publishes something new, I truly wish her the best. I truly do. Like, I don't wish any harm her way. Oh my god, what the fuck? If you read this book, let me know if you liked it. Let me know if you didn't read the book and you listened to this and you were like, what the fuck was this? You know, if you're just like, okay, so... Because I feel like there wasn't much going on in this book. There wasn't much of a plot. It was just all accumulating and leading up to the big fight at the end that lasted like two sentences and she just stops him and then it's like, oh, never mind. Never mind. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much to my members again. I love you so much. I hope you have a great Halloween. If you don't celebrate, I hope you just have a great evening. <laughs> Next video will be another podcast episode and then Icebreaker is already coming along your way. I'm already like 50% done. I can't stop reading. It's so good. It's just very easy to read. <laughs> Romance is just so easy to read if it's just smut, you know, I don't have to think. I just have to read about penis the whole time. I love my hobby. I love you so much. Again, thank you for watching. Stay happy, stay healthy. Peace and love. And maybe I'll see you in my next video. Bye-bye.